from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Ted Arloff here. Arloff? Los Angeles? That's right. Tri-Western Indemnity Company. Well, hi, Ted. Look, are you free to come out here in a hurry? What's up? A wayward truck. A wayward? That's right, truck. Lost, straight, or stolen? Well, that's what I hope you can find out. It's a big one. Insured for nearly 20000 That is a big one. And aboard it, when it disappeared, was the driver. Insured? For 10000 And a cargo of copper tubing worth 9500 Also insured. Holy... Ted, I'll grab the next plane. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-Western Indemnity Company, Los Angeles office. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the wayward truck matter. Expense account item one, $194.65, airfare and incidentals, Hartford, Los Angeles, California. When my plane set down at the International Airport shortly after 9 a.m., Ted Orloff was waiting for me. He led me on out to the parking lot. Here we are, Johnny. This car right here. All right. Go on. Hop in. Okay. You reserve a hotel room for me in town, Ted? Huh? Why? Well, after all, I've been sitting up in a plane all night and wouldn't mind a chance to shower and slick the whiskers off my pussy. Change clothes. Don't want to take the time. That's why I'm glad you could make it out here right away. See, this thing only happened Wednesday night. Well, just what did happen and who suffered the loss? And how about stopping somewhere so I can grab some breakfast, huh? Sure. Find a place along the way. Like I told you, Johnny, a truck loaded with $9,500 worth of copper tubing has disappeared. What kind of tubing? The kind they use a lot of in building airplanes, that sort of thing. Go on. It was shipped from Marlowe Copper Products over in East Los Angeles. That's where we're heading. Marlowe's a big jobber, distributor. Okay, so what happened? Well, late Wednesday night, a driver by the name of Jackie McAllen was scheduled to haul this order of tubing over to the Belden Aircraft Corporation over in Victorville. That's about 100 miles east of here, out in the desert. Yeah, I know. So? Well, the truckers usually drive that route at night, not only because of lighter traffic, but to avoid the heat during the daytime. Brother, you can say that again. Yeah. Well, anyhow, right after midnight Wednesday, 12.05 to be exact, Jackie signed out of the Marlowe warehouse with his load of copper tubing. Yesterday morning, Friday, Belden Aircraft was screaming for it, wanting to know why it hadn't been delivered as promised. Just disappeared? Just disappeared. Hijacked, obviously. And the driver? Any word of him? Nothing. Well, what kind of a market is there for stuff like that out here? Plenty of market for it. Not only because it's expensive, but it's hard to get, too. Especially for some of the new little companies that have sprung up around Palmdale and Lancaster, out that way. Yeah, didn't Lockheed just build a plant out there? Lockheed, Belden, a lot of the big ones... And they subcontract work to the little boys. That's why nearly $10,000 worth of copper tubing would be worth its weight in gold to those little plants. Well, then it's a wonder there isn't more of this kind of hijacking, if that's what it is. What do you know about the driver of that truck? Jackie McAllen is as honest as a day is long. Yeah, who says? His employer, and he should know. Jackie's been driving for Marlowe Copper Products for years. They trust that boy with a load of pure gold. Yeah. Yeah. What's that mean? No. Yeah man might have some trouble selling off a load of pure gold. Huh? But if what you say is true about the demand for copper tubing in this area... Oh, now, wait a minute. Well, every man's supposed to have his price, you know, Ted. Look, Johnny, I see what you're driving at, all right. But not Jackie McCaffrey. You sure? 10000 is a lot of money. Wouldn't be worth 10000 sold undercover. Jackie would certainly know where to sell it, though, wouldn't he? Johnny... And why hasn't he showed up? I'll tell you why. Because he's probably been killed. <laughs> Item two, $1.75, breakfast for me and a cup of coffee for Ted Orloff on the way into Marlowe Copper Products in East Los Angeles. I was amazed at the way this industrial area has grown in the past few years. The Marlowe operation turned out to consist of a small office and a couple of warehouses. Marlowe himself was a tall, lean man of about 50, very much on the ball. 
Yes, sir, Mr. Dollar. It's as simple as that. Now, Willie here is the night watchman. How do, sir? Hi, Willie. According to Willie's clock and the shipping order in the manifest, Jackie McCallion's sign is load out at exactly 12.05. And that's the last we've seen of either of them. He took off a loan with a load worth $10,000? $9,500, yes. Well, isn't that taking quite a chance? Well, he's done it many times. Mr. Marlowe, how much does this Jackie earn a week? Well, that would depend. Anywhere from 100 and... Oh, now, wait a minute. If you're thinking what I think you are, you're wrong, Dollar. You're dead wrong. Just as I said, Johnny. Sure, why? I'd trust Jackie with my own life. And believe me, whoever's done him in, well, he's going to have to deal with me. I'll see him hang. Well, what makes you so sure he's been done in? Well, it's the only thing that could have happened to make him give up a shipment of goods. A hijacker'd have to kill him. And whoever did this to Jackie... Tell me... Do you think there's any possibility of his having been approached beforehand by hijackers, perhaps threatened into turning the shipment over to them? No, not a chance. He would have told me of anything like that immediately. If he had time, maybe. Who's working on the case now, Mr. Marlowe? The L.A. Police Department and the Sheriff's Department of every county in Southern California. Are all your trucks like those two I see out the window there? Jackie's was. We got four of those big singles. Did have. Now it's three. And three big tractor-trailer rigs. Mm-hmm. A truck like one of those is a pretty big hunk of stuff to just disappear. Willie. Uh, yes, sir. Were you on duty Wednesday? Yes, sir, I was. Did you notice anything unusual about Jackie that night? Why, no, sir, not that I noticed. He came to pick up his truck alone, huh? I didn't see nobody else with him. Well, uh, did he look worried, anything like that? Well, not that I could see, no, sir. And he didn't say anything that might have indicated things weren't as they should be? Not that I heard, no, sir. Just exactly what did he do? What the driver always does, come in, signed in, signed up the manifest, putting down the time, and then drove off with his truck, like oh, Nothing unusual at all. Not that I saw, no, sir. Mr. Marlowe, where did Jackie live? Somewhere over on West 3rd Street. He lived alone. Naturally, the police looked for him there first thing. May I have that address, please? I'll have my secretary get it for you. You, uh, you all through with me, boss? Yes, Willie. If you're going to work tonight, you better get some sleep going. Yes, sir. Thank you. Right. And believe me, nothing's going to happen to anything this time. If I were you, Mr. Marlowe, I think I'd have more than that for a night watchman in a place like this. Just what were you thinking of, Mr. Dollar? Jackie's address, I mean. <sighs> Look, if the police and sheriff's offices haven't been able to turn up anything, well, in spite of what you said, there's always the possibility of collusion in a case like this. Between, between Jackie and whoever stole that truck? Oh, no, sir. There's always the possibility, voluntary or otherwise, if Jackie was in with the hijackers, even against this will... I, I wouldn't believe but it. But it's a possibility, whether you want to believe it or not. For one thing, how would the hijackers know when and how the shipment was to be made? From any one of a number of sources. The man who supervised the loading here, for instance. Oh, Red Kingsley, or almost anybody in the place, or just as easily anyone over at Belden Aviation in Victorville. Belden would know exact time of a departure from this warehouse? Oh, well, no. Close indeed. timing in a hijack operation is usually pretty important. But they knew the stuff was due at their plant early Friday morning. They've been hollering for it ever since. I'll lay my money on the tip-off coming from this end. Now... Has the route between here and Victorville been thoroughly gone over? By the police. And they found no sign of either the truck or this fellow Jack? That's right. The truck, of course, could be disguised. New coat of paint, that sort of thing, often done. But no body, alive or otherwise? No. So how do you plan to proceed? Well, if Jackie was forced to participate... And I I'm sure he wasn't. Then I don't know. Let me have that address, huh? <laughs> Frankly, I didn't have the least idea what I was looking for. But I couldn't just stand around, so I borrowed a company car with a name and a number plastered all over the side and drove to the West 3rd Street address, hoping I'd have no trouble persuading the manager to let me in. Manager? Not in that old ramshackle frame house. The front door was wide open, and the mailbox had the number four opposite Jackie's name. That meant upstairs. As I reached the second floor, I could see that the door of number four was slightly ajar. And I could hear somebody moving about inside, opening closets and drawers. Quietly, I slipped close to the door. Inside, his back toward me, was a big, broad-shouldered brute, hastily emptying one of the bureau drawers. He was dressed in dirty work pants and wore a heavy, tattered blue sweater. Hey, what? Oh. Maybe you better let me ask the questions, huh? Oh, yeah? 
Now, look, buddy. What are you doing here? What are you putting into those handbags? None of your business. Now, you get out of here. Not until I find out what you're up to. I said get out. Didn't you hear me? Oh, take it easy. Oh, yeah? You want to play that way, huh? That's right. Brother, that was a big mistake. Oh, you asked for it. Oh, no, you don't. All right. Now, start talking. What were you doing here in Jackie's room? Well, what was I doing here? Hey, look. Who do you think you are? The law or something barging in here like this? That's right. Who are you? I said, who are you? I'm Big McCallion. What? That's right. Jackie McCallion. of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the wayward truck matter. <laughs> Missing. A $20,000 truck from the Marlowe Copper Products Company of East Los Angeles. Also missing. It's cargo of copper tubing insured for $9,500. Also missing, also insured, the driver, one Jackie McCallion. And when I found a big, ugly-looking character going through Jackie's furnished room, I jumped him. And who does it turn out to be? That's right, Jackie McCallion. Boy, I'll say this, buddy. You, you're sure handy with your dukes for a skinny guy. Hey, who are you, anyway? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. And look, I'm, I'm sorry I must jump you. Uh, insurance what? Well, I came here to find out what happened to you and that truckload of copper tubing that never got to build an aviation over in Victorville. What are you talking about? Of course it didn't. Of course not. Well, why? <laughs> because the shipment was called off, that's why. What? Well, sure. It was supposed to go out Wednesday night, right after midnight. And it did. At least it left the warehouse. Oh, that's where you're wrong. Because me and Betsy, we was going to take it. Betsy? Yeah, Betsy. You know, my truck... Only the order got canceled out. Who says so? The office. Who at the office? Well, how shall I know? All I know is I was here in my room getting ready to go over and pick up Betsy and the tubing. And the phone rung and a girl from the office says the shipment is canceled out. What girl? Do you know? I don't know. Some girl says she was in the office or so. You know, one of the girls, like they always giving out the orders, you know. And uh, she told me the boss says on account of there ain't no more trips for me this week, I could stop my vacation right away instead of next week. But you don't know which girl in the office told you that. I told you. I don't know. I told her, tell Mr. Marlowe thanks, that's all. Why? D didn't she tell him? Where have you been since Wednesday night? Oh, well, down in San Diego, staying at my sister's and doing some yellowtail fishing while I was there. <laughs> you know, out around San Clemente Island. Boy, it ain't pulling in the big ones. Yeah, I'm sure wait, they are. Why there was one guy on our party boat that... Hey, wait a minute. Well, what do you mean the shipment went out? Just that. On schedule, a little after midnight. What that girl told me. And it hasn't been heard of since. You. You mean it went out in my truck? In Betsy? Who took it? According to everything we know, you. Oh, no, sir. By midnight Wednesday, I was halfway to San Diego in my car. Look, you ask my sister down there. I got there before 1 a.m. Call her up and ask her. Go ahead, call her. You're sure of that? Oh, well, sure, I'm sure. And if some dirty guy took my Betsy out, I'll kill him. Don't nobody write Betsy but me. Well, what were you doing when I came in here? Packing those bags in such a hurry. What for? <laughs> my vacation. What's the matter? Don't you hear good? Hey, well, look, mister. If somebody took my truck out... Okay, and... Jackie, okay, calm down and hey. come along with me. Where? We're going back to uh, Marlowe Copper Products to talk with a couple of people. Maybe to a showdown. Jackie, with a name like that, I'd pictured a slim, wiry little fellow, not this big gorilla. And from what he'd said and what he told me on the way back to the Marlowe warehouse, I was convinced he was telling the truth about his whereabouts the night of the robbery. But then, who could possibly have been a close enough double for Jackie to fool the watchman? Or had the watchman been trying to fool me and the police? And why? Or could Marlowe himself have somehow contrived to... But again, why? And if Marlow was up to something, well, he'd have been smart enough to put or at least keep Jackie out of the way. Honest well, Mr. Dollar, did you find... Jackie! Hi, boss. 
Hey, hey, what's going on around Jackie, here? thank heaven, boy, you're all right. Oh, sure, I'm all right. We thought you'd been killed or something. Oh, me, too. <laughs> Where'd you find him, Dollar? Where's the truck? Hey, boss, that's what I've been trying to find out. Only all this guy here does is ask me questions. Well, the important thing is you're all right. I didn't tell you this before, Dollar, but Jackie's as much a part of this business as I am. Ah, oh, come on, Ah, uh, you started out with me in the beginning when I didn't have a penny to my name. Worked seven days a week, night and day, helping me build up this business. And you've kept him just a truck driver? What do you mean, just kept me a truck driver? That's the way I like it. Ah. Oh. Yeah, even the big retirement he made for me. I don't want that. I just want to keep on driving the truck, just like I am. And maybe go fishing now and then. That's what I like, and I'm happy. Thank God you're still all right. Hey, but what about Bessie? Yes, Dollar, what about the truck? Any ideas, any leads? Mr. Marlowe, I want to talk to that night watchman of yours again. Oh, Willie? That's right. Let's just hope he hasn't skipped town. Skipped town? Would you Dollar, see if you can locate him and get him down here? Well, of course. Do you think he was involved in the hijack operation? Well, let's get him in here, if we can, and we'll see. Something had just come back to me. Something pretty damning insofar as Willie was concerned. It was the way he had answered my questions when I talked to him before. Was there anything unusual about Jackie when he came to pick up the truck? Well, not that he'd noticed, he said. Had Jackie picked up the truck alone? Well, he hadn't seen anybody with him. What had Jackie said? He hadn't heard anything. Not one really positive answer in the lot. Or to the other questions I'd asked him. Much to my surprise, Marlowe's phone call brought assurances from Willie that he'd come over to the plant right away. And I... I told him I'd get somebody else to fill in for him tonight because of the sleep he's having to miss. Yeah, well, tell me this. Uh, Do your watchmen carry a time clock? That's right. There are punch key boxes located in a dozen or so spots all over the warehouse and one in this office. Uh Uh-huh. They register on a paper dial on the time clock, Yeah, that's right. That way there's a record of what time he reaches every station on his nightly round. Would you get me that record for Wednesday night, please? Of course. And while you're at it, I'd like a copy of the shipping order and the manifest for that truckload of copper tubing. I'll have my secretary get them for you. By the time his secretary dug the punch clock record out of the files, old Willie arrived, looking somewhat the worse from lack of sleep, but apparently willing to cooperate in any way he could. I took him out to the watchman's booth, which was just inside the warehouse gate. Yes, sir, Mr. Dollar. This here's my old private office every night. And this is where you were when Jackie McCannion came to pick up his truck Wednesday night, huh? Well, now, where else would I be? Well, now, that answer is just as definite as the ones you gave me before, Willie, and it won't do. I asked you if Jackie said anything that night that might have made you suspicious. And I told you. Not that I heard. No, sir. Well, did you talk with him at all? Well, no. No reason to. There were just the two of you here in the middle of the night. Yes, sir. And you didn't even say hi to each other? Well, no. No reason. Driver comes around to pick up a shipment. He, well, all he has to do is sign up the manifest the time he leaves. You knew what time he was to be here, didn't you? Sure. I mean, yes, sir. It was right on the shipping order. But you didn't see him. You didn't see him pick up the shipping order or sign the manifest or drive out of here with his truck. Knowing he was coming, you left the gate open for him. Or knowing somebody was coming. That's against the rules, mister, leaving the gate. You weren't here when that truck went out. I didn't say that. No, no, so far you haven't said anything. You've just given a lot of evasive answers to all my questions. All right, all right. Now, if you were here, you were partner to the hijacking operation. No, sir. You'd have had to be. Because Jackie McCallion didn't pick up his truck that night, as you'd have us believe. If you were here at the gate, that is. And that's something we'll find out right now. Here. Say, that's out of my time clock. That's right. And it's dated the night of May 22nd and 23rd. Uh, that's the night? Yes. Now, where's Station 1? Why, that, uh, that's right there on the gate there. And, and and that's the key I use to punch my time clock. Every single night, right on schedule. And I don't know what you're getting at, Joe. All right, all right. Just listen to me and answer my questions. Station number one was punched at 11.41. If that's what it says, that's what it was. Now, where's number two? Well? Uh, look, I don't where like Where is number two? It's the big double doors back in the warehouse on the right. But now you look 1147. here. 11.47. You must walk pretty slowly. Well, of course I do. I look around. I make sure that everything's all right. Okay. Now, where's number five? Come on, number five. On the back gate, way around the other side of the warehouse. Yeah. A good quarter of a mile from here. 
And according to this time clock record, that's where you were at exactly 12.04 that night. And, brother, I'd like to see you do a quarter of a mile around these buildings in less than a minute to get back here at exactly 12.05 when you claim Jackie signed out that truck. Well. You're right, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Which way am I right? I... I wasn't here. I... I left the gate open for him, like I often done when I wouldn't be right there for a night shipment. Like you often did? Don't you see? Nothing like this ever happened before. And when I seen his name on the manifest, I know that You he... weren't here when the truck went out, so you don't know a thing. I mean, I thought Jackie took it because I left the catch on the main gate so it looked like it was locked. You ever done that before? Well, not for Jackie. He was always too close to the boss. Where he and the yeah, boss... Yeah, yeah, I know all about that. But I have for the other boys. Yeah. Jay, you've left this whole place wide open for anybody who wanted to come in and take anything he could lay his hands on. And this time it was a $20,000 truck with a $10,000 cargo. Willie, you're in trouble. Plenty. I questioned him further and got nothing more than a few tears and a plea for mercy. And then I turned him over to Marlowe. Willie was his problem now. But my own was still far from solved. I wasn't any closer to the missing truck and its cargo than I'd been when I arrived. Expense account item three, 220, lunch for Jackie McCallion and myself at the lunchroom around the corner. We were on our second cup of coffee. Good boy, you know, that was a good donut. <sighs> oh, sir, Mr. Dollar. And the more I think about it, the more I say that outside of them pretty girls in that boss's office, the only ones to be sure what time that shipment was to go out was Willie and, and Red Kingsley. Kingsley? That's his car I use. Yeah, yeah, that's the guy. He's in charge of all the shipping. Well, how much do you know about him? Well, I, I, I don't know. After all, you know, he, he's kind of over me. I thought your only real boss was Mr. Marlowe. Well, he is. You just bet he is. And, and he's the best friend I ever had, too. But if I don't keep my place around the plant, you know, keep subordinating to the guys that are forming and stuff, what do you think would happen to the morale around the plant? Well, tell me about Red anyway. Dollar, well, he... Dollar, Mr. Dollar. Oh, Mr. Marlowe? I just got a call from the sheriff substation in Victorville. Yes? They picked up some of that shipment of copper tubing. You see, we put a stamp on every piece. Then whoever hijacked it is already getting rid of it. Yes, but so far nobody's admitting where they got it. It's at Air Metals Company and Stress Products Incorporated, both near Victorville. You want to check on it? Use Kingsley's car again. Right. Hey, hey, you want me to show you the route? Okay, Mr. Warren. Sure, Jackie, go to it. And believe me, we went. I don't know whether the police along the route have been alerted to let us by or not, but we earned more than one speeding ticket before we hit the cutoff around Victorville. The cutoff that would take us on past Edwards Air Force Base where the plants we were looking for were located. All along the way, Jackie had carefully scrutinized every truck we passed, going in either direction. Uh, uh, no, no. Same make and model, but she and Betsy. Oh, Jackie, don't you realize that truck of yours is no doubt thoroughly disguised by now? Uh, you think a father couldn't tell his own little baby no matter how disguised it was? Maybe, but a truck... Yeah, now, now, look at that one up ahead. See the, the one we're pulling up on? Oh, it's the same make and model, only this one is painted green. Yeah, want me to slow up as we pass it? No, nah, she ain't, Bets. Even from here, I could tell. Red! Red! What did he say? Well, I didn't quite... Hey, wait a minute. That's Betsy. You sure? That paint job looks pretty that's old. That's Betsy. I know by her sound. You stop and block her off. Hey, Red, that's what he shouted. And this is Red Kingsley's car with a company name all over it. Yeah, that's why he thought we was red when we passed him. Sure, and look, look, he's catching up on us. Well, he sure knows we ain't red by now. Hey, look out. He's going to pile into us. He's going to ram us. Holy, hang on. Slapping you on a push this way. But come on. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, All right. I'm, I'm okay. Hey, your, your pal's up the road with that other truck. That's huh? the sheriff's car. 
Up, up there were a couple of thousand miles of copper pipe spread all over the country, sir. Oh, yeah. I edged him off the highway and he flipped over. Well, why did you do that? Why? Well, to hear those cops talk, you'd think I was a hero or something. Guys in the green truck rammed you off the road, didn't they? That's right. Well, when the cops seen that happen, they tried to force the truck off. Mister, that takes something like Clarabelle here. Clarabelle? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I call this tractor-trailer rig of mine. It's not the first time I've given the police a hand. Yeah? They've given a lot of people a hand, those boys who drive the big interstate trucks and trailers. They're a pretty fine bunch to have on the road. Well, I guess it's pretty obvious that Red Kingsley and Marlowe's shipping department was back at the hijacking operation. The two who were aboard the stolen truck turned state's evidence and sang plenty, and the courts will take care of them. Expense account total, including air transportation and incidentals back to Hartford, 50105. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week? Well, if you think a sudden case of complete amnesia is any fun, you're wrong. Because it happened to me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Forrest Lewis, John Daner, Junius Matthews, Stacey Harris, and Jack Crucian. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. 